All right, in today's video, I'm moving forward with the build of my RC four-wheel drive Trail Finder 2. This is a 10th scale truck that is basically scaled down to be as close to a real rig as possible. Have a look on the inside. I can see, for those who haven't seen this build or, or this truck yet, I know you're all like, ooh, ah, I'm still doing it. And I've been looking at this truck a long time. This here, my friends, you can see a spur gear on the front and a motor mount right here. This plate right here is a motor mount. This is a two-stage transmission for a trail truck. It goes back on this drive shaft to a transfer case right here. As you, know, you can look in the last build video and have an up-close look at that, uh, which connects to two drive shafts that I've already installed from the back aluminum cast uh, axle there right up to the front transfer case where the skid plate is. Isn't that neat? That looks so nice. Moving straight forward right up to the front axle where I haven't hooked up the uh, steering linkages yet. But I've got that right here and I'm almost completed, but I thought I'd kind of show you something uh, for all the first time builders that are thinking they should get this kit for the first time. Because it's, it's fairly easy to put together in my opinion. Uh, the axles come pre-built, the transfer case, the two-stage transmission, all that came in that white foam package that you see over there. Check out the last build video if you haven't seen it. Uh, so here we go. With the steering linkage, I'm going to cover one thing, something really simple. This is a rod end. You heard me right. A rod end. Rod end. Okay, this here has a set screw. It's a 1.5 millimeter diameter. So I'm using a hex driver. This is the team associated multi hex driver that I use. You can see here all the bits are in the end. Okay, got that snugly mounted. Now instead of going ahead and just zipping this into the end of the rod, this, is, this piece is threaded, so it'll just keep on going. You'll lose it right in there. So what I prefer to do is to try to be as careful as I can, line it up straight, and just set that set screw in the rod end. Okay, here we go. Zipping it in there, making sure it's nice and straight because you don't want it to be on an angle, even though the, uh, the rod end is on an angle with the eyelet there. Once that's in there fairly straight, then you go ahead and thread it into the steering linkage, okay? Making sure it's not super, super tight. You just want it to line up and to about there. All right, piece of cake, we can move forward. Now I have the small linkage and the long linkage set up. If you haven't seen this before, you'll see exactly what these are utilized for on the truck as we progress. Now, really, this video is going to be about electronics. Some people have a hard time with electronics. Some people think that, think that uh, electronics are kind of the boring part. Uh, I can understand because it is very tedious and it can be a challenge to do, especially if you have to do soldering and you're not familiar with how to solder. So I'll move forward with this very, very carefully and, and, and systematic so you can see how it goes, okay? The, the, this particular truck takes two servos. Why does it take two servos? Because it takes one for steering the rig, right? Right up at the front here. It also takes one for shifting the two-stage transmission. I'm assuming at this moment that it's going to be on an auxiliary channel that actually takes this little piece right here and moves it back and forth when you need it to, okay? So a servo is going to be moving that back and forth on a uh, ball joint. The servos that I've chosen to use for this project are actually dun, 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 high tech. Why have I used a high tech servo? My friends, I have lots of experience with servos and I gotta say right now on the market, this one is a waterproof servo. I have used plenty of other manufacturers waterproof servos, but this one actually has metal gears inside, yes. Doesn't mean that they're indestructible by far, but it means that it's a step up from the ones that usually have plastic gears where the slightest little bump can strip teeth on the inside and then it's no good. That's not the case. This one is the HS646WP, WP standing for waterproof, okay? Ultra Torque Servo. Let's see here, 
7.4 volt high voltage digital servo. You can go ahead and put an external BEC on this like Castle Creations 10 amp. I'll probably do that just so all the servos are getting the power that it needs when they need it, okay? I'll get into more of that when I'm having a look at it down the road. So now I've got the steering servo. I have the steering link. I've got the transmission servo in the back. Let's get a little bit of a closer look to what I'm actually doing. We'll start up front with the steering, obviously. Here's the servo that I'm talking about up close. And I wanna show you guys something because I'm gonna see my first modification here. Now, the instruction book is actually asking you to attach the servo horn to the actual short steering link itself. We could do that, but at the moment what I wanna to do to, to make sure everything's dry fitting properly is to remove the horn and the little washer behind the screw there, take that right off, and look at this, okay? On this particular model of servo, we have these strengthening plastic triangles on the side where it screws in. Now this really isn't gonna be under a lot of high pressure in this particular rig. Like I won't be stressing the servo as much as I would in my bigger rigs, for example. But at the same time, I want to ensure to maintain the rigidity of where it screws into place. So to be safe, I'm gonna dry fit this first. After I dry fitted it, I discovered Okay, here we go right here. Let's have a look at this one. That those triangles here and over here were actually in the way. So I removed them simply by taking a sharp razor, carefully cutting down the side, and then of course cutting towards the inside of the servo. Be careful though, that little plastic piece, it's gonna go flying, right? I did it on both sides because right here, it was jutting up against where it had to be dry fitted in. This is exactly why I do the dry fits first. Now, one of the big bonuses I love about the RC four wheel drive stuff is that because a lot of the parts are cast aluminum, check this out. This is one of the 10 millimeter screws, a button head screw that I'm supposed to mount the servo with. Well, because it's aluminum, I can be careful. I don't really have to have a nut on the other side they put a threaded hole right into the actual frame itself. Big bonus, I love this. I'm not gonna have to worry about anything stripping out and I'm just gonna be able to have a good time without having to put a washer or a nut on the other side. I'll go ahead and continue to uh, screw these in, get it mounted up and we'll move forward to the next uh, part of the build. All right, so I could have gone into more detail about the steering rods. Have a look, I'm just, it's shiny, so it's kind of hard to focus on for the camera, but check this out. This is what I'm talking about uh, with the threaded aluminum. Right there, in between this rod end and this rod end is a piece of aluminum that's actually the steering uh, knuckle right in between. Okay, you can see it's turning everything there. Same on this side. It's just a, a, a piece of cast aluminum that I was able to screw right into. I only used my hand driver, this one. I didn't use a drill because I don't wanna strip anything out. You gotta be really careful with that kind of stuff, right? So I just kinda hand torqued it in real smooth. This side was a uh, 22 millimeter screw that goes into an M3 washer, okay? The M3 washer I was able to hold on to by using the cross wrench that came with the rig. Then I just kind of hand torqued it in there, made sure to set it in, not too tight. And as long as you have that uh, top, check this out, that top steering link goes in between the actual leaf spring here, okay? You guys are like, oh, it's, why does it do that? You know, like they should have had, no, not at all. This is a great design. In fact, even with this steering rod, because it's lifted a little bit, it's lifted up to the steering servo. It is not going to get caught uh, at all binding, even when the suspension is flexing. It's a brilliant design. I love it. Uh, so I'm not going to attach anything to the servo yet. I want to make sure the electronics are installed first before I start centering and, and, and putting my uh, tires in the place that I would like. It's time to move on to the actual transmission servo. Now, this is the same servo. I had to go ahead and take a sharp razor, cut those uh, triangles out, 
If you're a young folk and you're building along, make sure that you get uh, one of your folks to do this for you because Sharp Razor does a good job both on plastic and on fingers. You gotta be careful. This actually doesn't fit in the front way. This actually, once you line everything up, fits in where you slide it against the two posts, okay? This you gotta keep in mind because if you don't cut that out properly, you won't be able to seat the servo properly against the posts. Now, you'd think we'd be zipping in all four uh, 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 holes here, but that's not the way this kit has been built. It actually only has two on either side, so here or one on either side, a total of two. So I'm gonna hand torque this in. Again, you wanna make sure that you're really soft when you're pushing this through, even though it's threaded well. What I'm trying to avoid is pushing the, the opening of the servo apart, right? I could almost use a small washer here uh, to kind of distribute the torque of the, of the screw going in. But building this stock, I wanna ensure that I can identify all this stuff right out of the box and one on either side. Even if you wanted to put four in here, my friends, they only have holes for two. Okay, so one here, one here. Which means I'm assuming that this servo is not under a lot of stress and that this, it feels like it moves and shifts very uh, fluidly. So, you know, that's probably why they haven't pushed four through here. And this one is now done. Okay, so now you can see both servos are in place. Isn't that a good looking rig? I love it already. And now my tires aren't flip flopping around. Okay, looking good. Looks like a bloody real truck to me almost. Very cool. Okay, so, so now the magic happens where I actually have to push the shifter eyelet to the horn uh, of the servo so we can shift it back and forth with the servo. Shows you here, easy to read instructions, that you are going to be using two of the eyelets with a 20 millimeter threaded rod. Now, here is the 20 millimeter threaded rod. Pretty straightforward. Go ahead, get this out, show you one right away. It's just a normal set screw, okay? Those little eyelets on the end right here are mini plastic rod ends. See? You know, does that focus on it for it? Focus, focus, rod end, okay. Move that out, gotta open up the bag. At least it's clearly labeled. I'll take two of these. Don't mind if I do. Okay, now that that's done, same thing as before. I'm gonna take a smaller 1.5 millimeter uh, uh, wrench. Let's just make sure I got the right one, 1 16th and 1.5 mil. Thread it here. I'm gonna push it into the rod end first and just slowly start threading it. Look at, I can turn it with my fingers so it's a piece of cake, just so you know. Okay, get that kind of set in there, not too far, but snug enough. Now I'm gonna take the other rod end and I'm going to do the same thing. Now you're gonna to have to fiddle with the distance. You know, I see that it says 35 millimeters from eyelet to eyelet. Okay, so what I'm gonna have to do is take out my measuring tape and measure 35 millimeters from the center hole to the other center of the hole. And then I will have my uh, throw arm for the transmission. Okay, so here's one of the things that I actually have in my studio that I use for building my kits and measuring things that I need. Uh, it's just a normal fabric tape. You guys can pick this up at your local uh, uh, dollar store if you have one around, fabric store, whatever. It's really easy to conform and measure. Like if I need the diameter or the, the millimeter rating or anything like that, just on a whim, I have it in my kit. This rolls up, super small, piece of cake. So I needed a 35 millimeter uh, uh, length between the eyelet of the actual uh, transmission shifting arm to the other end of the shifting arm. I haven't actually screwed this in for the same reasons as the front uh, steering. I wanna make sure to have my radio and everything, the electronics there hooked up so I can center it. 
But what I did was I used a 14 millimeter screw on the back with one of those M3 uh, lock nuts. And then myself, because I know these collars can be a bit of a bugger, and these screws, they are a little bit soft, like the metal is a little bit soft. So you wanna be careful. I actually used an additional one with a spacer to help me shift that transmission back and forth. Now I'm gonna get in close so you can see here. Just moving it back and forth, piece of cake, making sure that it doesn't have any uh, sticking points, right? So I haven't had to take this apart at all. It's been pre-assembled, but I wanted to make sure that it moved back and forth and it does. So that's no problem. And I'll put that in when I'm ready with the electronics. Now, this steering horn, pardon me, the, the servo horn, I was thinking of the steering up here. Actually, you know, you need to, uh, if you're using the same servo I am, you need to actually make a larger hole than what is stock because stock it comes with all these little tiny ones in there and the diameter of the screws that you're using isn't going to actually fit. So I will usually find a drill bit that's just a little smaller than the diameter of the screw. Okay. And I'll start to actually hand turn it and start rubbing away that uh, plastic that's on there until I'm rubbing and I'm twisting and it's, oh, okay, we're all the way through, check it out. Now we've got a hole that's totally usable. But make sure that you leave enough room on either side and that you're dead center uh, so it maintains strength. And then this hardened plastic servo will do uh, a long time. Like this will this will last a long time. You can always upgrade to an aluminum one. It will look cool and it will certainly function better in the long run. But for what we have, this will be okay for now. Moving right along. So now I've got all the servos in place. I actually had this servo uh, uh, screwed in wrong the first time. The, the horn should be on the far side of the back end of the truck, not up front, because it won't leave enough room for that arm to shift back and forth. But that was a quick flip around, piece of cake, and we're done. Here's another little mod that I normally do with my trucks. This is actually the receiver box. It's like a little gas tank area. I will drill a few holes in the bottom because most of my stuff gets wet or in the mud or whatever. And I'll use the same kind of idea, except I'll use a drill. I'll use a, a drill bit, zip a couple holes into the bottom when there's nothing in there. That way, if any water does get in through the side hole, it'll be able to go right through. You guys are asking me, well, what about the electronics? Aren't they gonna get wet? And the answer is yes. Of course, and, and if you don't have waterproof electronics, you're gonna be in big trouble when you're trying to go through the puddles and whatnot. And, and really, one of the things I always suggest is if you can get waterproof servos, get them. You know, that's a big bonus right away. If you have to waterproof your own servos, there's plenty of uh, YouTube videos, in fact, that show you how to waterproof a servo. And if you guys are watching right now, uh, uh, not on your mobile, but on your computer, right here, I have a little annotation of where you guys can learn how to waterproof a servo, okay? Other video producers also have that. Check it out, it's a pretty simple process. Nothing's ever waterproof, but you can always water resist something if you try hard enough, okay? Always be aware that if you put your RCs that are running on electricity into water, that you're gonna have a problem if you haven't done it right. Always be, pre be prepared that something's gonna get ruined. But half of the fun for me is to get it dirty and in the mud. So, let's move on. People have been wondering what I'm gonna use for electronics. Old faithful for me. I've been using these guys' products for a long time. Uh, Tekken, uh, FXR, Rock Crawler Systems, okay? Check this out. I've already got the FXR, which is the brain, okay? This is the brain, this is what regulates power. And there's the motor in the bottom. People always ask me, Medic, if I was gonna do a rock crawler build or, or something like that, what motors do you suggest? What setup do you suggest? And I always say, for me at least, just to start off with something standard, I use a 35 turn motor. What does the turn on a motor mean, Medic? Okay, that's another thing I get. Well, inside there's a commutator, okay? And if I disassembled this, you guys can use Google. In fact, I highly suggest G-O-O-G-L-E, google.com uh, and type in there, what does the turn on an RC motor mean? It will show you the number of times the wire is wrapped around creating an electrical current that turns, okay? The higher the turn, the less pulling ability, but the faster it spins. 
Okay, the, the, or pardon me, higher, I mean getting lower, like, like getting towards like nine turns, you know, this one's 35. If you get the lower turns, then you're getting the speed out of it. If you're actually going for a, a higher turn, like a 55T, yeah, 35 turns, if you're using a 55, it's not going to spin as fast and it's going to give you a lot of pulling power. Well, 35 turn for me, you guys, when I'm using especially a 1.55 tire, is plenty of power. This is going to give you wheel speed and torque. So if you're in the mud, you really kind of need to keep those tires going because it's heavy and there's lots of clay. 35 turn brushed motor is going to be okay for that. As long as it's clean water, you know, if you get any mud inside the motor here, it's really going to kind of be detrimental and, and burn down those brushes. Brushes are what actually deliver electricity to the motor. Here, look at this. Even though it doesn't look like your normal hairbrush, that, my friends, is a nice little brass, uh, I think it's brass, I could be wrong, uh, uh, basically a, a conductor of electricity, okay? They act on springs, the springs keep pushing them in as they wear down, finally one day they'll wear out. No big deal! This is brand new. The heavy duty motor from Tekken is, is ready to go. Like I said, tried, tested, true. There's tons of motors out there. This is what I use. The FXR, my friends, does not come like this. This is hideous and ugly now because I've plastidipped it. What's plastidip? You guys have seen me use this a ton of times, okay? Uh, I get this at auto value in Canada. You guys can get it in different areas depending on who stocks it. It's a liquid form of rubber. Okay, now if you haven't seen how to uh, waterproof an FXR, uh, again, if you're on the computer, here's an annotation right here uh, of a video I show how to waterproof an FXR. If you want to know how to waterproof uh, different kinds of ESCs, you really kind of got to do your research. I do, ha however, have a, a waterproof your RC cheap. You can click on the annotation here again. If you're on mobiles, annotations don't work, so I'm sorry, but uh, for the guys that are on their PCs and Macs, you can totally see it. Off to the side. Here's what this is going to look like, really straightforward. Uh, now that you've had the opportunity to see how to waterproof this, I get to fast forward because a lot of the people that do see RC Adventures watch this quite a bit. You'll see that I left the top of the posts open. No problem at all. I can uh, have uh, soldering joints put in right now, as well as I have the motor, okay? On these motors, on most motors, if I can get that to focus with my hand in the back, wait for it, wait for it, there. This side has a positive uh, embed, a little tiny plus sign right there, okay? This is showing that this side of the motor is positive for you to solder to. There's a tip right there or a tip right there. On this side is going to be the negative leads, okay? This is where the black uh, wire is going to go. Red wire, black wire, pretty simple. Uh, that way it's going to turn the motor the proper ways. It's going to get the proper power that it's supposed to have. And you'll notice that when you push the trigger on your controller, it goes fast forward. Right, if you have this done properly. If you are all done and everything's good to go and you're trying to get your truck to go and you notice that it actually reverses faster than it does going forward, that means that you gotta go back and switch the polarities here, okay? You gotta go and switch the soldering joints uh, and, and reverse it. But for right now, I'm gonna say that red this side, black this side, make sure to follow the positive and negative leads, you'll be a-okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and uh, fire up my soldering machine right here. This is probably one of the best investments I've ever made. I got this down at PM Hobbycraft. Um, this is a soldering station. For those who aren't good at soldering because they have like their, their pen solderers that they, you know, they just plug into the wall and they're trying, they're like, ah, it's not working. It's usually because it's not getting hot enough, okay? I know this is a screwdriver, but I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> I fought tooth and nail and thought that a nice inexpensive uh, $10 soldering iron would be the way to go for me. And it is if you're kind of an occasional hobbyist, but I got to tell you, uh, they call this track power speed equipment now. They actually had a different name on this. I can't remember what it is right now because I'm filming. Uh, but this gives you an adjustable dial to do your temperature, right? Normally I like to solder around 700 degrees. 
People have varying uh, methods of soldering. Lots of different uh, YouTube producers and hobbyists have different ways of doing it. I myself, bum bum bum, even though people are gonna hate me for saying this, I like to use flux. It's, it, it's a cleaner, it, it kinda helps uh, let the solder be, um, well, it's, it's not an adhesive, but it helps the solder stick to the wires, okay? I'm gonna show you something really simple right now before I end the video today, because I'll go ahead and mount up all my electronics uh, off camera, it won't be a big deal. Okay, here we go. Got my red and my blue and my black, don't need a blue right now. Here we go. I'm just going to do something called tipping, okay? I'm going to expose a small amount of the wire on both, well, I won't do both sides. I'll just do one side because I want to make sure I have a nice clean uh, uh, soldering, you know, or a nice clean wire job, short wires. Go through, put a little bit of flux on this. I know, I know, I know a lot of you guys are like, what are you doing? Um, I find it's just a lot easier for my style, okay? So this will actually help wick the solder into the wire itself. And what that means is kind of absorb it in there. So here we go. This, I'll, I'll just kind of let you see this a little bit, even though I'm sure there's varying opinions on this, you know, but eh, it's my hobby. I like doing it the way I do it. I also try, you'll notice that it wasn't just all a whiteboard today. I actually have this foam on the background. There's a reason for this. When I use flux, it likes to spit everywhere and whatever. First, I'm gonna tip the end of my soldering iron, okay? Nice and warm. That's why I also like this soldering station. It, it, it moves quickly, it, it heats up rather quick. Again, we have the flux on the end. There we go, draws it right into the wire. Now, instead of just trying to blurb it onto the motor, where a lot of folks like to do that, now I have something called a pre-tipped wire. Okay, look at that. Now it's got solder already on the wire. Yay, I like this, because if it's not hot enough, it's not gonna stick properly, even with the flux. Flux does help that, though. And my dad's a plumber, right? Like, I've always grown up with flux and soldering and different things like that. Uh, a lot of times you can actually get solder with flux already built in. So you just gotta heat it up, touch the flux and the solder, piece of cake, you're done. Now that I know which is the right polarity on the motor itself, I'll take, again, a small bit of flux on here. Just making sure everything's cleaned up properly. I know you guys can tease me, it's no big deal. I like using it though. Okay, flux on either side. Kind of want to make sure your motor is going to be mounted. What's the proper way you want it mounted up? What's it going to look like? You know what I mean? Um, let's just say I'm going to do it here and I'll do it on the top tabs. So I'll have the sticker out. Oops, it's going to go on the front, I'm assuming. Yep, keeping the weight up front. That's exactly what's going to happen there. So there we go. So I know it's going to be sticking out that way. I'll actually just go ahead and put that on top. Just a tiny dab will do you. Dry fit it again just to be sure. Yeah, I'd rather, as they say, measure twice and cut once. I'd rather do it the right way the first time. And a little bit of solder. Heat it up onto that post. Piece of cake, that's where the positive will go. Here's where the negative post will go. Now I've pre-tipped the posts. With those posts pre-tipped, we'll just, you can see it even without it focusing right away. Focus, it's because I have smoke in the background. Okay, we've got solder on the tabs. You can see clearly there. Really clear with the motor where it's red and black on either side. Now, because I pre-tipped, all I have to do is melt one to the other. Yeah, piece of cake. I actually like a really strong uh, soldering connection. The last thing you want to do is be out in the field trying to fix a broken soldering connection that you could have done better while you were doing it. So make sure you have enough. You don't need a lot. Okay, it does take a little bit of practice. I've done this a few times now, as you can imagine. And done. Okay, same thing. So you just got to repeat all the way around. I'll just do it quick for you guys. I know you guys are probably working on your rigs right now too, so I'll continue with this. Don't need to do it all off camera. People always ask me, is it okay to put an electric 
uh, RC motor in the water, medic, don't you don't you fry it a lot of times? And 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 my answer has always been repeated with a simple. If you use a brushed motor, brushless usually has sensors, and you can't really put that in the water without a higher risk of it uh, being damaged. Brushed motors, on the other hand, can uh, go into cleaner water, right? If it's really dirty, mud's going to get in there and really be uh, uh, detrimental to the brushes that are in there and wear down that motor real quick. On the other hand, uh, if you're in kind of a clean stream, brushed motors can run underwater without shorting out at all. Right? It's the rest. It's the ESC, like the brain, this part here. That's why I put some... Uh, uh, a plastic dip on it. You don't want that to get wet because it's going to immediately short out everything that you're you're uh, working with and you're not going to have any fun when you're on the trail. So now that that is in place, dun 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 dun, that's how quick it is, that's how easy it is, right? Especially with the right soldering station. Uh, focus, there you go. That's a nice crisp picture right there. So I'm going to go ahead, I know you guys are like, oh, it's not attached on either side. It totally is. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use, let's see, do I have any heat shrink on me right now? I don't. If I would have been more prepared, I would have shown you what uh, heat shrink tubing is. It just slides on. I'm kind of looking around and stalling a little bit right now, but I don't see any uh, that's easy to use. Heat shrink, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it'll just go over here. I'll heat it up. It'll go... Yeah, and kind of seal that up so I've got a nice strong connection. Well, now that I have that in there, I'm going to want to position my ESC in the right way because I'm also going to want to do the soldering boards on the back. I might as well show you. I'll pre-tip the soldering boards as well, just with a quick little uh, blurb of flux there. You know, some people say it's messy. I don't care. <laughs> it probably is, but I really don't mind. And I'll just kind of melt... Uh, Melt the flux on there a little bit because my iron has a little bit of solder on there as well. Kind of make sure it's all stuck in there properly. Beautiful. I love it. Some people hate doing the electronics. I actually think it's a lot of fun. Once you have enough practice, it's really part of the model building experience. And done. Piece of cake. Yep. Let that post heat up. Take that flux in there, take that solder. Oh, one more. I, I could do a little bit better on the end here. And like so. Okay. Pre-tipping. Let's see if I get this to focus again. Focusing. There we go. Okay. Pre-tipped. Now, you guys are probably wondering, why is there so much plastic on the heat, isn't it? Or on those uh, brass uh, posts, isn't it supposed to distribute heat? You bet it is. Don't worry, I've been running this a long time. Even through the top, like you're running a two-cell LiPo battery through here, it can take a three-cell. This uh, 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 can take a three-cell with a 35 turn and higher. Okay, I prefer a two-cell. You know, especially when I'm running in the mud and it's really drawing a lot of power. The motors, I, I find, is, is where it will have a little bit of a heat issue. The FXRs, I've had very good luck with, hence why I'm, I'm still working with them. Okay, so I can go ahead and uh, attach the uh, wires here, but what I'm going to do is lay it out on the actual trail finder itself. And uh, once everything's mounted up, we can go ahead and start painting up the body. I'm going to uh, try to do my ultimate best and make it look as scale as possible. I don't know if I have enough skill to do it, but you're darn well know I'm going to try uh, because, my friends, I always enjoy doing RC adventures for you. And hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. Again, here is your look at uh, the Trail Finder 2 from RC Four Wheel Drive. Happy to build this kit. It's about time I've done an ultra realistic look uh, at, a, at a trail truck. So I'm excited to get this done. If you guys uh, want to comment below, I totally encourage it. If you want to post up your own scale video below, I'll automatically approve it. Uh, if you like the video, please give it a, a thumbs up. I do appreciate it. And if you're an RC addict, make sure to subscribe up above and I'll see you on the RC Sparks forums. Thanks for tuning in.